New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. How did Franklin Delano Roosevelt win re-election in 1936, despite America being in the throes of the Great Depression? And that wasn't a squeaker election either, my friends. It was a huge landslide. The landslide of all landslides. I'm talking Q Stevie Nicks here, because a landslide is going to bring down his opponent, Alf Landon. We'll look back with a man who's been called the undisputed champion of chronicling American presidential campaigns next. Let me warn you, and let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says, of course we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on IR Radio. And a special tip of the hat to everybody watching today's time travel adventure via our YouTube channel. You can find me at historyauthor.com or across social media platforms. Plus you can read my columns in the New York Sun to get my analysis of current events through the lens of all the history I've learned from these books on the shelves behind me. In this episode, our time machine welcomes back legendary historian, man I was just talking about, he's David Petrusha. And he's here to discuss his new book, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 Landslide, and the Triumph of the Liberal Ideal. David Petrusia has written or edited a treasure trove of stories. You've seen him on C-SPAN, the History Channel, ESPN, Fox Sports, AMC, just about everywhere. You can enjoy his previous appearances in our archives where we discussed his books, TR's Last War, Theodore Roosevelt, The Great War, and A Journey of Triumph and Tragedy. Rothstein, The Lifetimes and Murder of the Criminal Genius Who Fixed the 1919 World Series. 1920, The Year of the Six Presidents. 1932, The Rise of Hitler and FDR, Two Tales of Politics, Betrayal, and unlikely destiny. And finally, his memoir, Too Long Ago, A Childhood Memory, A Vanished World. That interview like this one is on video and it features a lot of clips and never before seen movies, as we say in the TV biz, never before seen footage from David's childhood in upstate New York. He was really kind to break out those Super 8 tapes to share with me. Actually, there were reels back then, so it, it's quite a while ago, and yet he's a very, very young man. And you'll hear from him in just a minute. Please do enjoy those interviews in our archives wherever you're listening now. And you can find our guest at dpetrusha on Twitter or davidpetrusha.com. That last name is spelled P-I-E-T-R-U-S-Z-A. Okay. Now that we're ready to hand the keys of our time machine over to a man who knows his way around the past, let's join David Petrusha in 1936 as the newspaper headlines blare, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation. And here we are with David Petrusha. He's going to share his latest book on presidential election history. It's called Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 Landslide and the triumph of the liberal ideal. Thanks so much for returning to the History Author Show, David. Good to be back. 
Well, good to once again hold the David Patricia book in my hands. Everybody watching via YouTube can see it over my shoulder there. We have that big grinning Roosevelt. And so FDR is somebody, is one of those guys that the New York Times book review will say, we're not taking any more books on him because there's just too many, right? Him, Washington, Lincoln, they say, we've had, we've just had enough. Can you give us a break for a little while? But your book manages to do something with a figure like that, that is real hard. And that's find something new to tell us, find a way to make it interesting for people who may think I know all about that guy enough already with the FDR. So you go back to a period to do that, which we don't look at too much that first term and then his efforts at reelection. So how do you see, tell us what was that first dangling thread you see that you say, I'm going to pull on that and see if I can get a book out of it and explain to people what they're going to get in Roosevelt sweeps nation that they haven't seen before. Well, I've done these election books previously, starting with 1920. And 1920 was one of those big blowouts, too. One of those, those books where they say, well, that's, uh, there's no drama there. There's no story. And, and besides, it's Warren Harding and James Middleton Cox. Well, yeah, but there were a whole bunch of other things going on there. And there are a whole bunch of other things going on beneath the Electoral College and the popular vote totals in November. And the story is how you get there. And it was not a necessarily a given, A, that it would be the big landslide, or even that Franklin Roosevelt was going to make the trip in 1936, because a lot of people, and not just hopeful Republicans and conservatives and ticked off uh, either conservative or populist Democrats, were hoping that FDR wasn't going to make the trip. But so were the people on his side. Uh, off and on. And so were some of the pollsters we consider to be more scientific, more reputable. And so you get that backstory and you get a terrific cast of characters in this book too. I mean, you, I mean, 1920 had six presidents coming and going in that. And 1960 had Nixon and Kennedy and Johnson. And this one doesn't have a lot of presidents, but it's got incredibly colorful figures like Huey Long and Father Coughlin and William Randolph Peirce, and then the pension movement and the people surrounding the head of the pension movement, uh, Francis Townsend. So you get all of these people and you get the shifting of various groups in the election, most primarily Blacks, but not limited to Blacks, and, and really the whole country shifting from Republican to Democrat. When Roosevelt is elected in his 1932 landslide, the Republicans are still the majority party. Most people are still Republicans. It's something like 56% or so. And then the Republicans get blown out even more in 1934. And so it's, but, but it's still, they still have 52% of the voters, but that shifts to something like 46% in 1936. The country becomes democratic and is going to stay democratic for quite a long time. Um, so you've got all of those factors going on. And then you've got, oh, like the Supreme Court knocking important pieces of legislation out or or previous decisions. And how is the president and how is the public going to uh, respond to that? So all of those things and how politics is the same as back then and how it is different things that this book, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, touches on and that I wanted to touch on in the interview, because as a political animal myself and somebody who finds this interesting, this is what we might call a realignment. And yet it's really more like a political earthquake, which is another cliche. There's really no word for this. Maybe we should just call it a 1936 in the punditry business because it's so huge. And you mentioned we don't have any other presidents running in this election, but that's not for lack of effort by Alf Landon. And he has to be the guy to be the Washington generals up there running against FDR and get his, his lights blown out and his clock cleaned. So who is he? How do we get to know him? You mentioned that cast of characters, which is in the front of Roosevelt Sweeps Nation. It's a nice, nice service you provide there to the reader so everybody can jump right in. You don't have to already have studied this period. But who is Alf Landon and how does he come to be the guy who is the guy that ends up losing 46 of 48 states to FDR for re-election. Alfred Mossman Landon 
was the governor of Kansas. He had been an oil man, not a Texas oil man, but a Kansas oil man. He had been a progressive Republican. He was known in 1935, 36 as the Kansas Coolidge, a nickname which he hated. Um, he was given that um, nickname because he had balanced the budget while the while the uh, New Deal was running up deficits and you know breaking open the piggy bank and spending on everything. He had uh, cut government spending in Kansas and he had kept the budgets in balance. But he hated the name nickname the Kansas Coolidge because he was not a conservative like um, oh, uh, Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> so he's an old progressive. He had supported Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. Uh, when he bolts the Republican Party uh, and gives the election to Woodrow Wilson. And this election is kind of the triumph. It's an ashes in the mouth kind of triumph of the progressive Republicans of TR, because not only is Landon the nominee, but his running mate, Frank Knox, a newspaper publisher out of Chicago now, had supported TR in 1912. The previous Republican nominee had supported TR in 1912. And then you see People like William Bora running that year, and he had been he had been a progressive, but he was in such a maverick he wouldn't half the time he not half the time better than half the time he wouldn't support anybody except himself. And so Landon is out there, and there's not a lot to choose from for Republican candidates when you've been blown out in 1932, when you've been blown out again in 1934. There's hardly any survivors. So you have Bora running. He is this, this maverick progressive. The Eastern conservative wing of the party does not care for him. They think he's almost like a stalking horse for Franklin Roosevelt. There's a senator out of Michigan, Arthur Vandenberg, running. He's not quite there yet, never will quite get there to, as a nominee. But he will be nominated by the convention for vice president. And he doesn't want it. He doesn't want it because, <laughs> well, he's told by Senator Bennett Champ Clark of, of Missouri, a Democrat afterwards, who congratulates him on, on turning that down. He says, you don't want to ride in the backseat of a hearse. <laughs> <laughs> Clark knew what was going to happen in, in, in November. So he's one of the nominees. Herbert Hoover wants it, but it's like, let's not go down that road again, which leaves Alf Landon and Alf Landon gets a big boost early in the campaign season by William Randolph Hearst. Hearst, for some reason, actually, Hearst is, is put on to him by another newspaper publisher called Paul Block that there's this guy out in Kansas and he's really, really good. And Hearst starts boosting him in all the Hearst papers, which are a phenomenal force at that time. They have like 22, 24% of all the circulation of all the Sunday papers in America and all a whole bunch of magazines and radio stations and the newsreels. So he's, he jumps on the Landon bandwagon. And in the absence of meaningful co competition to Landon, Landon is going to sweep through to a pretty dull first ballot triumph at the Republican National Convention. Just the word you want associated with your campaign, dull. I think the, the Coolidge thing gave him a little bit of spice, and I found that interesting. Right. In sweeps Nation, because it, he was a successful president. I don't know what the opinion I'll ask you was of him in, in the nation in, in that era, in 35, but he or 36, eventually the election comes. But it seems to me that it, it would have been good to be associated with somebody who was maybe made you think back to the, the good old days. And so it, was that something public that he did, that he distanced himself? Did he feel, especially with a fellow progressive running mate, that maybe he could use a little bit of, of uh, conservative spice sprinkled over his agenda? Or was it, what kind of politician was he, especially as compared to FDR, who we consider a real political animal, but basically from when he was in the crib, dressed like a little girl? <laughs> well, F FDR is, um, FDR doesn't write his own speeches. Um, he's not a writer. He doesn't write books, you know, like Herbert Hoover writing, uh, you know, uh, all these apologies for what he did for forever after he left. But he is a great performer. 
And like with the Hollywood studios and they produce movies in the 30s and MGM and all this, you have a big stable of writers. And FDR has a big stable of writers. They put together these speeches and sometimes he really you know, just takes a few pages from one draft and a few pages from another writer's staff draft and puts them together, which is what he does, does at the 1932 convention. So he melds things, but the speeches are always his own and he's he's very good at that alf landon is not very good at that uh, somebody says he oh oh i think it was father cogman says this is the guy who always puts the the applause line in the middle of the sentence and then trails <laughs> off he, and and you know the observers say we've never heard anything quite this bad on the radio um so he's he's not good and he doesn't stay, as they say nowadays in the cliches, laser focused on the message. And what is even the message? I guess the message is, is more efficiency. Because in 1934, when he's running for re-election, Harry Hopkins, who is the right-hand man for welfare and relief to Franklin Roosevelt, sends uh, Lorena Hickok out. Lorena Hickok was the great friend of Eleanor Roosevelt. And she en ends up in Kansas and says, boy, I don't know how the Democrats are going to fare in this state because the Republican sounds like a, Landon sounds exactly like a new dealer. So he goes into the convention or into the campaign with a generally progressive record on the national issues. And then he doesn't go to the convention because often people didn't go to the convention then. But when you have to do a big catch up to a titan like Franklin Roosevelt, well, what do you do? You know, roll up your sleeves and go on vacation in Colorado and then plan two more vacations. So he gets out of the box very, very slowly there for weeks. There's no real campaigning at all. But when he does get up and rolling, he's very vigorous and very bad. He gives a <laughs> series of Colorado. speeches <laughs> at the end of the campaign or towards the end. Um, where he talks about tariffs and protection and alienates a whole bunch of supporters. Then he gives a talk on farm policy, agricultural policy, where he talks really crazily out of both sides of his mouth, where it's going to be efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. We're not going to spend the money, and, but we're going to give the farmers A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, and even some stuff they haven't even thought about. And, and so that's a bad performance, but the really bad performance is in Milwaukee in late September, where he decides to touch the third rail of Republican politics, social security. Republicans had not opposed social security. They hadn't proposed it, but almost no Republicans vote against it in the Congress. It's not an issue until he gives this speech. and says, well, uh, I kind of like it, but everything here is wrong with it. And when he says, <laughs> I kind of like it, the conservatives go, no, we don't like it. And the all the people who do support it, which is a bunch of people, even though it's a very limited program at this point, it only covers like half half the people in the country. They say, why is he why is he critiquing this? He's against it. He's against it. And he wants to take this away, et cetera, et cetera. And then the party piles it on with a couple speeches. One, the head of the Republican convention says that the workers are going to be, you know, like collectivized and they're going to have to wear dog tags, uh, you know, when they go to work to identify them as part of this social security program. So it's a basic <laughs> fake news QAnon theory going out in 1936. Then the Republicans put forward a program to stuff the pay envelopes of workers with messages saying, do you trust the Democrats? Are they going to keep their promises? They haven't kept their promises on a lot of things. They tried to take away pensions from Spanish American war veterans and, and the World War I veterans. They, they, there were laws which said that bonds be paid off in gold. Well, they weren't going to do that anymore. Uh, and they certainly didn't keep their promises about spending and cutting back government by 25% in 1932. So why should you trust them now? And this gives the Democrats, because this message is sent out two weeks in advance, plenty of time 
to hit back and they hit back strong and they make social security a big issue in the campaign. And that just pours gasoline on the Republican conflagration. And, and the rest is 46 to two in the electoral college. It's an incredible blowout. And to watch the mechanisms here of how things work, I think even for people that aren't political animals like you and I that don't really follow this stuff, not that I would put myself at your level, at your level, your business, but it's it's fascinating for anybody, I think, to go back and just see how we get there. Make FDR more than just the guy who is uh, smiling up at us from all of these, all of these, uh, he's on money, right? He's on, he's on everything. But at this period, it's it's not a it's not an accepted fact. It's not known, obviously, the future that he's going to end up serving longer than any other president. So that, I wanted you to take a moment just to tell us a little bit about who is he in 1935, 36 as a president when he's running for reelection? Is it just a book, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, that, oh, well, of course, he was going to win. He was super popular. Uh, he was, I want to take people back to that that period so that they could see what was really going on. Well, we, we have to keep talking about Great Depression in the context of this book and the great and, and the election because it ain't over. All right. And there's a big boom right when he takes office from March. He took office in March, not January back then to July. And all the economic data goes way up. Employment, hours work, steel production, auto production, you name it. Then it goes down again. He puts a couple of programs in the NRA, which is a micromanagement of business, great and small down to how much you're going to charge to press a pair of pants. And people are going to be prosecuted for not charging enough. And the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which is to create scarcity and a time of scarcity. It's like, OK, farmers are a big voting block. Twenty five percent of the people are still farmers. And he had, he had always had big support from the farmers in 32 and 36. So let's jump up farm prices. And we'll do that by plowing under crops and slaughtering livestock and, and creating scarcity, which of course creates higher prices for the people who have to buy this stuff or use this stuff or clothe themselves or feed their families. So the Supreme Court knocks these two things out. At the beginning of like 1935, people are saying, oh, 63 percent of the of the population is supporting the New Deal. And that drops down to a bare majority as the year is beginning. Then you see in at, in the spring, George Gallup, the new pollster kid on the block, the scientific pollster, asked the public, well, if there were only two parties, which they basically were anyway, but they were called conservative and liberal. I don't know if I did that right. <laughs> the uh, that which would you pick? Who would you belong to? Fifty three percent conservative, which does not quite fit into our idea of what the public is like in this time of, shall we say, radical change. Also, in The New York Times endorses Roosevelt. Uh, at the end of the campaign, he, they say, well, we hope he's more conservative in the second term. So there is still this streak of, of non-progressivism, shall we call it, and it's pretty strong in the country. And Roosevelt can be very reactive to things. He's not always pushing the things he's noted for. So he does have the bank moratorium, which was actually, well, the bank holiday, which was actually Hoover's idea of a bank moratorium, but Roosevelt puts the happier face word yeah, on so it. So much better. That's, That's so, so much better. Much better. <laughs> We're having a holiday where you just can't get your money. Oh, go uh, enjoy. But, and that, that helps because they go in and they audit the banks and they say, these are okay. And, you know, calm down people. And they do. But also FDIC which is that Arthur Vandenberg's not quite idea, but he's the main guy pushing it in Congress and Roosevelt doesn't like it. But this really stabilizes confidence in the banking system and puts money back in the banks and then they can go out and invest in jobs. Up, 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 up. 
but Roosevelt doesn't like it at first, and then he takes credit for it. The NRA is a reaction to a wages an hour bill from Hugo Black, which is just crazy stuff. And Social Security is a re he doesn't want to do it at first. He throws cold water on the first Wagner Act when Harry Hopkins gives a talk one day and says we got to do old age pensions. Roosevelt from the same podium, like in 24 hours, goes, no, uh, the priority is unemployment insurance. But then when this Townsend plan is gaining more and more and more steam, then after it is introduced in the House of Representatives, the next day, Social Security is introduced by Franklin Roosevelt. Or when uh, Huey Long, the demagogue from Louisiana, wants to soak the rich, um, Roosevelt does the same thing with a, with a tax plan. So in, in some ways, he's reactive. The, the stream carries him along of the times. I wanted to bring up a review for you in my newspaper, The New York Sun, where I work. People can see my columns. I often quote you or occasionally quote you and your fine work and insights. Carl Rollison gave Roosevelt Sweeps Nation a really strong review, and he posed some questions that he said he had no idea if you ever asked yourself these questions, but he had them after reading Roosevelt Sweeps Nation. And one of them is this. He said, how can one write history so that it seems like a thriller? So that's the question on the table. I figured I had the opportunity. I would I would put it for you. How do you do that? How do you take these sometimes really dusty political figures from history, especially in Alf Landon, you told us the guy's, guy's pretty boring, uh, and make this read like it is a thriller, even though we all know the end. We have thrillers and then we have mysteries. And the mystery is, I don't know how the hell I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think part of it is but is that if you actually look at what's going on at the time, okay, and see all the before people know. I mean, we know what the ending is. We know the butler did it, okay? But they don't know the butler did it. So they're filling up the papers with all these stories and then you're you're seeing also the memoirs of people where uh, they say, well, we, uh, back then we didn't know what was going on. So while Roosevelt is off floating around on a boat in the North Atlantic in the middle of the campaign in September, the Democrat bigwigs hold a, you know, a powwow, as they used to say when we could say such things. And uh, Eleanor is there, who is often, shall we say, torn between whether she gives a rat's behind on whether Rosa, her husband wins or not, depending on what mood she's in. But she comes away from this meeting and, and, and it's, it, things are in such bad shape with the campaign. You know, she writes a very strong shape up memo to all these guys. This is not January. This is September. So people don't know. And when you put all those details in, I think you you kind of distract people from what they know is the ending where the butler did it. You provide all these other clues going the other way. And they're not dishonest clues. They're what's really out there. You're enjoying my conversation with David Petrusha about his new book, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 landslide and the triumph of the liberal ideal. You can follow him at D Petrusha on Twitter and visit his really great looking website. And there's so much on there that you will experience so much of David's work. If you enjoy them, it's davidpetrusha.com. Amity Schlaes, who is the author of Great Society and Coolidge, among other books, writes of Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, quote, historian David Petrusha brings the stunning 1936 Roosevelt sweep to life with timely lessons for our current challenges. David, I wanted to focus on that word stunning. We've, we've talked briefly about that, that this is something that is a surprise. Nobody could know the future and at the time. But I, I think that that Great Depression, being in the middle of it, and I think it's very hard for current Americans to think, well, of course, he's not only is he going to win this re-election, he's going to win 
two more two more Super Bowls, basically. Like who who goes back and looks at that that second Stanley Cup the Montreal Canadiens won, or who goes back and looks at the second one the Islanders won when they won four, like his four terms in a row. It, and so I, I wanted to mention that if you're an average person, even if it's election night, even if it's a, a month or two months before. How could people possibly be stunned by this? And how will readers therefore be stunned when they read this story in Roosevelt Sweeps Nation? You've still got tens of millions of people on relief or in government, I wouldn't say make work jobs. It's more than making, raking leaves or anything like that. You're turning out dams and post offices and the Triborough Bridge and you know all sorts of things which are useful and which survive to this day. But you also have real questions then because people were not people were not so comfortable with just printing money. <laughs> they knew Imagine. that printing money could be a bad <laughs> thing ultimately. So deficits and deficit spending and government debt was a concern. But also more to the point is in November, 1936, the unemployment rate is 13 to 14 percent. This is not what I would call a robust recovery. And again, add to that all the all the millions of people who are uh, receiving government checks. So where is the recovery? I mean, you can argue that and it has been argued that, you know, Roosevelt does not really get us out of the Depression. He provides security for people. He provides all these projects. There is a reform, say, of the stock market or the banking system. But it was, you know, reform, recovery, blah, blah, blah. And well, where's the recovery when it's 13 to 14 percent unemployment? So Roosevelt has to convince the public or at least half the public or close to the public, uh, the majority of the public, that the glass is half full and not half empty because it is half empty. But it, certainly 46 to 2 in the Electoral College is not half. So that's stunning. It is. You look at that map and I'll, I'll throw it up for people watching on YouTube and you say, well, where's, where's the other? It seems like the entire thing is just red. This seems like it would just be a meme from one party or the other. They put those out somewhere. Let's win every state when they know that the realistically they have their states. There's now we call them red states and blue states. Right. And we say, well, these are the few purple states where they're going to concentrate. So that kind of a, of a landslide is just something stunning. I wanted to bring up Mike Purdy, and I interviewed him about his book, 101 Presidential Insults, what they really thought about each other and what it means to us. And also he's going to be on to talk about his upcoming book, and that's Presidential Friendships, How They Changed History. One of the men in that is FDR. One of the friendships in that is FDR and LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So I asked him to submit a question for your book here, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation. So I'll let you listen to Mike Purdy's question, and then you can have at it. Well, we often talk about how Ronald Reagan was an actor before he became president, and his background um, helped him in the presidency as he acted out the role of a lifetime. Franklin Roosevelt was also a supreme actor. In public, FDR could be ebullient, smiling and confident, while behind closed doors, he could be personally cold, cunning, and calculating, often void of emotions. So my question is, were FDR's behaviors deliberate to keep people off balance? Were they just part of his personality? Or was he just making things up as he went along? Go ahead and have at it. Mike Purdy's question, a columnist for thehill.com, so a fellow political animal there. I think the answer to the first question is all of the above. And you see, it may be surprising to people to see how ice cold Franklin Roosevelt could be. Harry Truman says he was the coldest guy he ever met, just calculating and all that. Harold Ickes uh, confides to his diary one day the same frustration and says that if, you know, if people around him died, who would he care about? He said it was probably Missy Lahan, his secretary, and Harry Hopkins and his children, but that's about it. 
notice he left out Eleanor. Okay. I was point that out. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, partly it's an act, like I was saying earlier, that FDR is is a great performer. So he's not just a great performer on the radio. And he gets audio transcripts, which are very hard to get back then, of his of his speeches on the radio. And, and why? It's not out of ego. Well, maybe it's a bit out of ego. But it's to study it and to see what he did right and what he did wrong. So he's he's always performing on that level and he's performing in public uh, but in between you know he's also doing that when he's meeting with people face to face when he meets with uh huey long or father Coughlin at the beginning of their relationship they they leave saying okay he agrees with us um william lemke was the union party candidate of of the long Coughlin forces uh, ultimately he he thinks the same thing everyone thinks this and it's a great skill to have except when the when the rubber meets the road and you have to do something like that i think one of the great anecdotes in the book is roosevelt finally gets on the campaign trail late in the campaign he's going through the midwest and on the train is tommy the cork corcoran uh the young new dealer who is was, who was the fellow who wrote rendezvous with destiny that's that's his line but Tommy is on the train and FDR says, well, Tommy, did you learn anything on this trip? And Tommy says, oh, it was very, it was very interesting, Mr. President. But the, the, the one thing I didn't understand was every politician who got on the back platform of the train with you left thinking he was going to be under undersecretary of agriculture. They can't all be undersecretary of, of agriculture. How are you going to resolve that? And Franklin says, well, that's one of the challenges of being president. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but Mr. President, how are you going to resolve this? And Roosevelt says, I determine who would cause me the most trouble if I didn't give it to him. So very cold, <laughs> very calculating. Yeah. Same answer or same sort of answer he gives into Henry Morgenthau, who was actually a very close friend and neighbor of his. Uh, about you know who is the real Franklin Roosevelt? It's so it's very he's he's an enigma. And in at Hyde Park, uh, his home, there's a presidential library and museum. And in there, I remember seeing for when I was a kid a big paper mache cartoonish rendering of Franklin Roosevelt as the Sphinx. The cigar cigarette holder is out there, but he's the Sphinx. Well, he's no sphinx like Calvin Coolidge, but he's a sphinx in knowing what he he really believes. And this is given out not by this is not created by the Republican National Committee. This is by the Washington Press Corps, who was very friendly to him. When I guest hosted the Derek Hunter show, you called in for an interview on that radio program and you raised a parallel between President Biden's son, Hunter, and between FDR and talking about, we talked about some families that have always been troublesome that uh, Harding said it about his friends, right? Uh, gosh, I can handle the, I can handle my enemies. My, my friends save me from my friends. And many a president has felt that way about their family. And you also mentioned that other thing about Eleanor. I thought there was something really cool in Roosevelt Sweeps Nation where you write that the Republicans had deluded themselves into believing that she was a liability and she's not she's a a kg operator there even though their relationship had long laid in tatters as you put it by this point in 1936 what about that family what about those those people that you you mentioned howard Dickey saying well he would care about the kids if everyone around him died those were important to him but everybody else felt a little bit like eh, he would just swap them out for another uh, assistant or undersecretary of agriculture. So what was the family like around him? What will people learn about the toll this is taking after that first term on the family and what it says to us today when we look at maybe a, a presidential son or child, also a former President Trump's family. There you go. They, they've just been uh, indicted or they're going after them here for, for organization, Trump organization business. What can we learn from 1936 about how the Roosevelts handled that spotlight? Franklin is is pretty close and has pretty good relationships with his with his children, um, kind of like Theodore Roosevelt in that regard. But um, and uh, James, a big strapping guy, of course, Roosevelt is a big guy, too, um, is his literally his strong right arm 
because it's it's James who has to prop him up and hold him up as he, you know, either stands to give a talk or that does that sort of pretend walk he does to uh, to get from one place to another. But it's really not a, a, a walk per se. But in the parallel to what happened in the previous election with Hunter Biden is is this. One of Roosevelt's sons was Elliot Roosevelt. Elliot was already kind of working the other side of the street for cash. He had gone to work for Hearst as Hearst is turning on Roosevelt. And Roosevelt doesn't blast Hearst, maybe because his son is working for uh, William Randolph Hearst's paper as the aviation editor and then taking over the radio uh, arm of, of the Hearst empire. But in October, the October surprise, in October of 1936, there's an aviation industry magazine which breaks a story about Elliot Roosevelt. And the story had been out there for two years. And the story is this. In 1933, one of Roosevelt's first programs is the Import-Export Bank because he wanted to um, export some things, okay? to get foreign countries to buy things and then businesses make money and employ things and all right but uh, foreign countries are broke too so what do we do we back up the truck to the federal government and we lend them money okay we lend central america money and we run we lend uncle joe stalin and the soviet union money and it's specifically in part to lend the soviet union money they decide they want to buy 50 commercial planes from one of our big companies like Boeing or something. And who's the broker for this? One, the broker is none other than Elliot Roosevelt, who for these 50 planes, which are not going to be like Aeroflot, uh, Stalin wants to turn these into bombers. Now, this is the time of um, in our history of great isolationism and a real second thinking of what world war one was about and the merchants of death so the dupont family which is against roosevelt from the right in the democratic party they're bad guys because they sold all the munitions to everybody merchants of death so you don't want to be selling exporting these armaments to foreign countries and you're going to see that in the 1930s Roosevelt, Elliot Roosevelt, is going to get a half million dollar commission from this. The Nye Committee, which was that sort of merchants of death congressional committee um, in, in the Senate, blasting the uh, sale of armaments to foreign countries, has sat on this story for two years. Beyond this, it comes out that uh, there was a $5,000 fee given to Elliot Roosevelt before the deal collapsed, which was not reported on his income tax. And that's, this was after uh, they, those are, those are $36 or 35, $33. These are million, in, 30, in 35, $36. Okay. okay. These are not in, you know, um, so that's, that's a substantial a of amount of money. <laughs> and this is when they're going after Andrew Mellon, the former secretary of the treasury for his taxes, when they're going after Huey Long for his taxes. Um, when they're going after Hearst and his mistresses, Mary and Davies, for their, for their taxes. But they don't go after uh, Elliot Roosevelt. And the Nye Committee says, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. And they give the excuse that the deal didn't go through. So therefore, there's nothing to see with the failure to report taxes. And that's the story of the story. And the story essentially just dies. Uh, in, in October 35, uh, 6, and Roosevelt gets to run with basically as the father of Social Security at that point and attacking the Roosevelt's for uh, the Republicans for that. He hadn't even supported initially, and then he gets to come in. And it, it's, it's funny to look back and entertaining when somebody rides in. But at the time, you have to think there were a lot of frustrated people that were left saying, hey, this was my baby. I had to drag you to it kicking and screaming. And the, the person that rides in at the last moment, if there was a scene in the Simpsons that people remember and the 
Bart gets down a well and everyone's coming because he falls down trying to dig him out. And Sting comes, the the rocker Sting. And he digs him and digs him. And he finally gets through after all these hours of hard work. And Homer Simpson just shoves him aside. So Bart's the first person he sees. You saved me, Dad. And I, <laughs> that was what reminds you of all things. That, that was uh, FDR knowing how to jump in there. And so many ideas that were needed to be tried and failed and to be able to come in and make sure he was the father of a lot of these ideas. And that's what sets him up. That's one of the skills here that sets him up, right, for this huge sweep in Roosevelt Sweep Station. He's really a tremendous politician and and knows how to ride all those waves. And also, you know, Robert Wagner from New York has, has, has been a team player his entire career, first with Tammany. He's a, he's a Tammany guy. And then as a New Deal guy. So he's, he's not going to create waves with the Roosevelt administration. And, and he knows that ultimately he may get his way on a whole bunch of things. And he does. The, La, uh, the Wagner Labor Relations Act as well. So one of the lessons there to how to deal with it is uh, make sure you have the press that likes you. Make sure you have a lot of politicians that think, well, he agreed with me that time. Maybe he's going to give me what I want. So they keep quiet. And that this is something today uh, or recently anyway, with uh, Michael Bloomberg, I thought, boy, he's going to have an easy ride in the press for a long time because people like me who are in the news business, you think, well, what if I want to go send my resume one day to a Bloomberg company? The guy's one of the richest men in the world. I don't want him Googling my name and finding out I wrote something critical of him. And so that that that's a fascinating part of Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, how he does what he does. And people who read it can can figure out if they think that that was the the best for the country at the time. I think uh, history has is, is given him a pretty high place, right? So we could, we could judge him by that in part. You're a skillful author who crafts these enjoyable stories. So I wanted to close by asking you to play not historian, not pundit, not future historian or alternate history novelist, but play boardwalk pitchman for me. We're, we're in a recession at the moment, not a depression, not a great depression. So money is tight for people. Why should they spend their hard earned shekels on Roosevelt Sweeps Nation? Take this trip with you and meet Roosevelt as he's on that cusp of the path to greatness. If he loses this election, he's he's out of the history books. He's just another one termer. So why should people spend their money here on Roosevelt Sweep Nation and go on this ride with you? Well, unfortunately, uh, while the federal government is now spending money on every every single thing, they are not subsidizing this book. <laughs> so if you wish to support strong, fascinating, never forget its scholarship and, you know, entertaining, you know, you get facts and entertaining. It's not like some you have to choose. You get the breath mitt and the floor wax, as they used to say on Saturday Night Live <laughs> with this book. So buy it. <laughs> well, it's definitely an excellent book. And you do that. I think everyone who hears you, this is, this is just how you write, except you're, you're able to edit yourself if you think you've made a joke that doesn't work, which is a great power for a writer to have and an awareness. But this is what you get in all of your books, David Patricia. Thanks so much for joining me today. I hope everyone will pick up Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 Landslide, and The Triumph of the Liberal Ideal. It's really an entertaining book. And if you're worried about some of these things we mentioned today, if, they're, if you say, oh, I can't scroll my phone one more time and look at Twitter, everything's going crazy out there. I don't want to look at my grocery bill, my gas bill. Well, take a trip back to the Great Depression. It's inspiring to see, you know, everything tends to work out in the end. Just hold on. So thank you so much for holding on with me today, David Patricia, and I wish you the best of luck with Roosevelt Sweeps Nation. Thank you. Again, the book is Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 Landslide and the Triumph of the Liberal Ideal. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying a book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to David Petruccia for another wonderful interview. He is so much fun, so knowledgeable. And if you think, man, I'd like to hang out with that gentleman. Well, next best thing you can do is pick up one of his excellent books. Visit our guest online at D Petruccia on Twitter or davidpetruccia.com. And while you're at it, you can let me know what you think of the interview and the History Author Show 
on Twitter at History Dean or via Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you enjoyed watching today's interview via that YouTube channel, please go ahead, reach down below or wherever they put that button and go ahead and click subscribe, share with a friend. All those things you're used to content creators telling you to do. We really do appreciate it. At least I know I do. And please also do check out my columns in the New York Sun. Please do check out all of David's work. I, I can't recommend him highly enough. You'll really, really love his books, even if you don't like history. <gasps> And of course you like history. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until that next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. And on behalf of David Petrusha and FDR, and I throw off Landon in there too. Have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York.